Hi, and welcome to Breathing Life into the Laws of Physics. I'm Sarah Walker, and I am a theoretical physicist by training, and I work in the field of astrobiology and think a lot about the nature of life and the origin of life in the universe, and I'm looking forward to discussing these ideas with all of you today. Um, so the first part of this academy is going to be focused on the universal laws of life. Um, so how do we actually identify whether there are universal principles that underlie all life in the universe? Um, and I wanted to start by first explaining where the quote that is um, sort of inspired uh, the title of this academy came from. Um, so there's this uh, very well-known book, A Brief History of Time by Stephen Hawking, where he mentions that even if there is only one possible unified theory, it is just a set of rules and equations. What is it that breathes fire into the equations and makes a universe for them to describe? Um, and I thought this quote was particularly relevant to what new physics might underlie life and help explain life in the universe. Because right now we're in a state in physics where our theories, not only do we need to ask questions about where our equations come from, but we also need to recognize that they don't explain us. Um, and so in um, my field that I was trained in, uh, theoretical physics, We've had a huge amount of success about describing reality at a really fundamental level in terms of understanding the fundamental forces of nature and realizing that certain unifications of them, um, say, for example, the unification of electricity and magnetism um, in the 1800s leading to electromagnetism, or more recently, um, the electroweak force in the standard model of particle physics have been really successful at describing reality. And we think that we can keep going um, to what's called the theory of everything. Um, but of course, as David Krakauer, the president of the Santa Fe Institute points out, the theory of everything is a theory of everything except those things that theorize. Um, and so all of these sort of laws that we've come up with are actually inventions of biology and they don't describe the biology um, that you know, has actually come up with these ideas. Um, so I'm really interested in trying to uncover whether there are deep principles that also explain life um, and some of the things that I'd like to talk about with you all today um, are that some of the things that life does seem to challenge the laws of physics um, as we understand them now and might actually demand entirely new principles and frameworks. Now, why do we think that this approach might even work? Um, well, I am, as I mentioned, uh, trained in theoretical physics, so I have very much have this bias um, that we have um, uh, in my field, um, thinking that mathematical principles uh, should apply to pretty much to everything in the universe and there should be a fundamental understanding as possible. Um, and so Albert Einstein kind of puts this idea very nicely that the general laws on which the structure of theoretical physics is based um, claim to be valid for any natural phenomena whatsoever. And it, with them, we should be able to describe a theory of every natural process including life by pure deduction. So I've added the emphasis of life because obviously that's missing from our current descriptions of physics. There's no explanatory framework for what life is. Um, but I wanted to just emphasize that this is very much the mindset of um, traditional approaches to physics. So I'm still maintaining this mindset that we can find universal principles. Um, whether or not that's the case is still a subject of open debate. So maybe life just doesn't conform um, to the kind of understanding of reality that we get from physics. Um, I am optimistic that it will, um, but it might look quite different. Um, but it's still open possibility that it doesn't. Um, so one of the things I wanted to start with saying where sort of the dichotomy is between the way we've done physics for the last 300 years or so and what new principles might be necessary to explain life um, is uh, to think about sort of the difference between how we think about dynamics um, in life and what life does as an evolutionary system um, and uh, how we think about things in physics. Um, and so this quote um, now comes from a Nobel laureate, Frank Wilczek, who was one of the pioneers that really led to the success of the standard model of particle physics. Um, and he points out in one of his papers that since Newton's time, we divide the description of the world into dynamical laws that paradoxically live outside of time and initial conditions upon which those laws act. Um, and this was in part what, in, you know, this observation is one of the reasons that Stephen Hawking made this point about what breathes fire into these equations because they don't exist inside the universe by our current descriptions, nor do the initial conditions. So these are sort of boundary conditions we need to put on the universe in order for our physics that we have currently to work. Um, now, this gets really interesting when you're talking about biology because the Newtonian paradigm 
Um, and the way that we kind of construct all of the theories of physics that we have to date are based on this idea that we have an initial state and some fixed law of motion. So an example would be, um, say, Newton's law of gravitation, which explains, say, planetary motion. Or some of you may be familiar with the formula F equals MA, force equals mass times acceleration, right? So the there's no... Um, change in the actual equation, what changes is the variables in the equation. So the law itself is fixed and should apply to any mass of object. Um, so these are sort of the ideas that were first established by Newton and we still use today. Um, and um, part of the challenge here is that if you want to explain how the world exists as it exists now, you have to use um, one rule um, and sort of fine tune the initial state to explain the details and features of the universe today. So for example, if I wanna explain how it is that I'm here um, at this festival talking to all of you right now, um, somehow the initial imprint of that information had to be in the initial state of the universe and then was generated basically by the laws of physics operating on that initial state. So this is kind of an extreme view, but this is one interpretation that you could have um, and many people do by taking sort of the, the standard um, laws of physics as we understand them and then interpreting how they apply as an explanatory framework. Um, now, the difference with biology that we see is really we have sort of evolution, um, if you will, in biology. So you can start from one initial uh, state or many initial states and end up in many different final states. And what do I mean by that? Well, um, we have um, something that we call um, sort of genetic heredity as an example. Um, you have common ancestors, for example, with maybe your cousins and your aunts and uncles and things, but you're all very different, even though you kind of descended from similar um, a genetic lineage. And so part of the idea that people have talked a lot about is that biology has this kind of um, multiple histories or possible histories, and they're very contingent on the particular environment um, and particular features of the system under study and the interaction between those. Um, and so we don't really seem to have this kind of um, application of a fixed law as being applicable to biology. Um, and this idea, of course, goes back quite a long way to the invention of evolutionary theory itself um, with Charles Darwin. So he has this beautiful quote um, that whilst this planet has gone cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity, so simple beginning, endless forms, most beautiful and most wonderful have been and are being evolved. So of course, the Newtonian paradigm allows you to take an initial state, like say the configuration of um, planets in our solar system. And once you understand the law of gravitation, you can run that system forward in time. And in principle, you should be able to predict um, where all the planetary bodies will be in the future. Um, now, there's obviously challenges of that in practice, because once you start having multiple interacting bodies, there's extra terms in the equations that become more cal cumbersome to calculate. But in principle, um, sort of that's the foundation of how we think about things in physics. We take an initial condition, we have a, a physical law, and therefore we should be able to predict how the system behaves indefinitely. Um, you can contrast this with Darwin's Endless Forms Most Wonderful. And so this is kind of a more uh, pictorial visualization of what I was showing on the previous slide with this idea of the multiplicity of paths that biology takes. Um, so here we have this um, last universal common ancestor. So I'll talk about this a little bit more in the second talk we have this morning. Um, but the idea um, here is that all life on earth descended from what's called the last universal common ancestor, which was really probably a population of cells on early earth and since and that's sort of the first um, evidence that we have for life on earth and the first knowledge that we have of a sort of modern machinery that we have in biochemistry today but since that time what we've seen is that all of these amazing species that basically cover the surface of our planet from us to fungi uh, to bacteria um, and even viruses and all of these things um, have sort of descended from this common ancestry. Um, and it's not just that the biosphere has created a lot of organismal diversity, but it's also created a lot of innovation in other things. So for example, um, I am you know sitting here um, talking with you all on a computer and I have a phone with me and a pen um, and a cup. And all of these are technological artifacts that are also the product of the evolution of life. Um, now, a question is, could you predict, um, say, if you knew the, the last universal common ancestor and all of the conditions on planet Earth Earth at that time, could you have predicted that four billion years later or so, or three and a half billion years later, uh, a cup would 
would form, right? So, so this is sort of the question. So a lot of people that study evolution um, think that you couldn't pre-specify what is going to evolve. Um, Stuart Kaufman is very famous for saying this, that evolution is actually not pre-statable. You can't predict what's going to happen in the future. And so this is sort of one of the major distinctions between when we're talking about trying to explain life and trying to understand it with sort of the current paradigms that we have in physics, that they don't exactly fit together um, for this very reason. Um, and so just to kind of um, bring the message home a little bit more, it's actually related to some very deep paradoxes um, at the foundations of mathematics and computing. Um, and um, sort of the clearest place that we can see this sort of dichotomy, um, it was with this nice quote by Nigel Goldenfeld and Carl Woese. Nigel Goldenfeld is a physicist. Carl Woese um, was a biologist uh, famous for discovering the three domains of life, or well, the archaea, the third domain. Um, and um, what they, they point out is that in biology, we encounter a situation where the rules must be self-referential. So remember we said in physics, the laws are fixed. Now we're saying that the rules are not fixed, um, but they're actually self-referential rules. Um, what they mean by that is the update rules change during the time evolution of the system in a way that they change as a function of the state and the history of the system. Um, and so an, an example of that is just to think about genomic information inside a cell. So we have genomes inside the cells in our bodies. Not all of the information in the genome is expressed at once. Um, so it can get read out into proteins. Which proteins are expressed actually determines the level of gene expression. And so there's this feedback loop where the information in the genome specifies what's happening, but then that what's happening specifies what's being expressed as far as the information. Or you can think about the fact that, you know, you have thoughts, your thoughts, um, maybe if you if you believe your thoughts influence your behavior, um, you know, there's a lot of subject to open to debate about that, but that would also be sort of a self referential dynamic where there's some emergent property of the system that then influences the dynamics and what happens next. Um, and in fact, I mentioned that this is related to the foundations of computing because the self-referential nature is actually foundational to um, what Turing discovered um, as far as um, the insights around the halting problem and Kurt Gödel's work about sort of the incompleteness of mathematics. Um, and so there's some very deep paradoxes associated with self-reference and this feature that a system might define its own rules and then be able to act on itself. Um, and so this paradox is actually really nicely captured by this um, famous illustration by M.C. Escher, which um, was trying to capture this idea of self-reference. If you have these two hands and one is drawing the other, uh, where do you actually say um, causation starts? Um, and in physics, it's very simple where causation starts. We have sort of elementary particles, and then we have laws, and everything else is supposed to be derived from that. But in biology, it seems that the actual properties of the physical system itself in part determine how the laws are going to behave in the future. And this is what we mean by saying that biology has a self-referential loop or so, um, sort of is some kind of capacity to uh, change the rules <laughs> of the game it's playing. Um, and so, um, so this is sort of one of the most important distinctions between um, physics and what might be necessary to explain life. Um, and in fact, I, I wanna just point out that the issue with sort of a fixed law of motion and initial conditions is not just problematic for trying to apply the way that we've developed physics historically to life, but it's also problematic in some areas of fundamental physics itself. So I had pulled that quote um, from Frank Wilczek earlier, but he also points out in the same paper where he's just talking about standard physics. So this is part high energy particle physics, um, gravity, you know, sort of things that we usually think about when we're thinking about fundamental theories of reality um, and where they're going in the next hundred years, um, he points out the fundamental laws should no longer admit arbitrary initial conditions and will not take the form of evolution equations because even in fundamental physics, these, these things are uh, problematic. And so one issue, just to, to highlight a specific one that I already mentioned is this issue of fine tuning um, because there are a lot of issues about having to fine tune sort of the initial conditions to specify kind of what you wanna observe. And the initial conditions are not given for free. Um, we have to put them in or we have to derive them from another theory. And so these, these kind of things become quite challenging if you want sort of an ultimate explanatory framework. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.